Hello, Feminine Roadmappers. Welcome back to Feminine Roadmap Podcast, the podcast that helps you navigate the challenges and the changes of midlife. If you find us on YouTube today, don't forget to ring that bell so that you don't miss any more of these amazing conversations. If you happen to be on a podcast platform, please subscribe, rate, and share this podcast so that we can share this amazing content with as many women as we can. Today, friends, we're going to be talking about people-pleasing. You know, what is the origin of people-pleasing? Why? Why do we tend to people-please? And when is it a good idea to use the skill of people-pleasing? And to have this conversation with me today is Amy Green-Smith. She's a life coach, a hypnotherapist, and a communication expert. Amy, thank you so much for being on the show today. Hi, Gina. I'm so excited to chat with you. So I have to let the audience in on our history. So Amy and I both worked for a major cosmetic company and she was my trainer. And I mean like way, way, way back. So we have this like makeup and other lifetime connection. (laughs) And I was so excited because she went on and did a podcast, wrote a book. I'm doing a podcast. We have brought ourselves together today for a reunion to talk about this idea of people pleasing. And I would love to have you share a little bit about yourself and a little bit about why this message. Ooh. So I think for many of us who are in the personal development sphere, we tend to have something that we surmounted ourselves in order to then give credence to sharing that with other people. And my situation is, is very similar. So yes, as you mentioned, we probably were connected about 20 years ago, something like it. It's probably (laughs) approaching that. Yes. And which is wild. So it's very cool to see you in this element. So thank you for having me. So my story around people pleasing and kind of finding my voice, which I look, I look at those things as, as being typically antithetical, right? Like there's the people pleasing behavior of making sure that everyone else is okay. And then there's the ability to actually speak up and articulate what you, your wants, needs, and opinions in a way that can be heard. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, this really surfaced early on uh, for a bit of context. I grew up in a very, very extremely conservative, um, born again, Christian family. And my father had a master's in divinity and a doctorate in ministry. So he was definitely not messing around. And, uh, I was by all accounts, the quote, good kid. I was the eldest and I put myself through college, got married young, moved out of the house, started working when I was 14. And my brothers did not really follow that path. They had trouble with the law, did some jail time, didn't go to school, that sort of thing. And that kind of comes into play a little bit later. So everything kind of comes to a head in 07 when my father passes away. And Mm -hmm. having a makeup background, I felt very convicted that I was going to do makeup for his viewing. So we've reached the dead dad makeup portion of the of the chat today. Uh, but I felt like it would be kind of a jerk move to be have that skill set and then be like, oh, dad, go get your own makeup artist for your viewing. So I felt extremely convicted that, you know, I wanted to do the makeup for his viewing. And I also wanted to speak at the service. And up until that time, and you might remember this version of me, uh, up until that time, I really shielded my family from who I truly was, that um, I identify as queer, that I am no longer subscribed to the faith that I was raised in and have have really changed in so many ways. And so when my husband and I would go visit my parents, I would kind of say, okay, no cussing, no drinking, no talking about any liberal agenda, no gay rights, no (laughs) Howard Stern, no South Park, like just, and, and so I was really kind of presenting this facade and this veneer. And so it kind of came to the head the day of his service. I feel like I'm winning at daughter because I'm doing dead dad makeup. And then I'm getting on this platform, speaking to hundreds of people all who carry a very different ideology than myself, get back home to my mom's house. And she finds it the most opportune time to say, it feels as though your father and I have failed as parents because the three of you are no longer subscribing to the faith traditions that you were raised with. 
So it didn't matter that I was this incredible human. It didn't matter that I had stayed out of jail and actually had gotten a degree and, and made a lot, made something of myself because I didn't subscribe to the faith traditions. I was grouped into this sort of disappointment and I could only muster to say to her, uh, you probably shouldn't say that to a child. <laughs> and she said, well, that's just how I feel. <clears throat> and I realized in that moment that there is a very, there's oftentimes a crucial pivotal point when you have to decide between making everyone else happy and making you happy. And I don't think that speaking up for yourself or giving voice to things is always an ultimatum. In fact, I think it's frequently not an ultimatum. But I realized in that moment, I could keep shape shifting, I could keep contorting and twisting to be what she wanted. But if push came to shove, and I needed to decide between making her happy and making me happy, I was going to choose me. Mm. And I'll tell you what, the trajectory after that was incredibly combative, adversarial. Like once I sort of decided I was not going to be shrouded in this veneer anymore, it was like I wanted to fight about absolutely everything we were polarized on. Mm -hmm. And I sort of was a bat out of hell. And it wasn't until many, many years later of realizing that I had to apologize for my delivery of how I was presenting stuff to my mom that I realized, oh, you can actually have conversations about incredibly polarizing belief systems. You can ask adult children's to children to move out of the house. You can ask for a divorce. You can sever a business alliance and you can do all of those things with the utmost grace and kindness. And that really became sort of the the impetus behind the work that I do now. So it's kind of twofold. It's this internal element of genuinely believing that you matter. It's your worthiness. It's believing that my wants, needs, and opinions are valid. Believing in your own enoughness. And then the external element of, okay, if that's how I reside, if that's the place that I embody, then how do I communicate that with the outside world? How do I deal with overbearing in-laws who maybe have different beliefs than I do or who want to feed my children things I don't want them to eat? Or how do I deal in the workplace with somebody who says something that's really offensive to me without, quote, opening up a can of worms? Mm -hmm. And so the logistics and the semantics of, of difficult conversations really became my wheelhouse. But again, antithetical to that is our pull to people, please. And and I started really digging into that to, to understand sort of the human behavior behind it. But that story, that that very real hiding and acquiescing to others around me was a part of my process and even being able to teach it now. Mm. Let's talk a little bit about how people, like what are the conditions that often surround people pleasers like what obviously i think it's often a personality type you know there are certain people who are more inclined to people please than others you know so let's talk a little bit about what you've learned around what are kind of the um <laughs> uh you might be a people pleaser if you know <laughs> like what causes yes. that and what are the uh, identifiers of a maybe a typical people pleaser well, I'm really glad you brought that up, Gina, because there are often times when we say the word people pleaser or that sort of moniker, we get a very specific vision. We think of somebody who maybe is really meek and mild. Maybe their posture is a little bit more uh concave or repressed. We think of them being very soft-spoken, um, not really flexing an opinion very much. And I really think that's fairly myopic. I think being a people pleaser, at least in my approximation, is more that we are sacrificing something of self in order to make sure that other people are happy, caretaking for other people's emotions. So for example, if you are super concerned about what you look like when you're running errands because you might run into someone, that's a little bit people pleasery, right? It's like, ugh, I have to 
give myself all this extra work to get dolled up when there's a cost. Like I'd rather be spending my time doing something else, but I'm doing it to placate truly how women are supposed to be perceived in our culture, right? Yeah. So we have to look at it through a much more nuanced and and a larger lens, I think. Mm-hmm. But as far as like where it comes from, I think it's really helpful to understand that people pleasing is rooted in our fear response. So if we if we've heard of fight, flight, freeze, fawn, right? Fawn mm-hmm. is a little bit newer on on the uh, platform here, but fawning is essentially if we're talking about it in primitive terms. If you are about to be attacked, let's say by a mountain lion. We know what fight, freeze, fawn, or uh, flee looks like, but fawning would be to say, here, kitty, kitty, here's some food, go over there. You know, (laughs) you would be, essentially fawning is either placating or acquiescing to an aggressor or a captor in order to stay safe. Mm -hmm. So our primitive ancestors had to belong to a group in order to stay safe. You didn't have tribes of one. You had to be together in order to survive. So that is also how we've gotten, if you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, one of our primitive human needs is for belonging. That comes from our survival. We needed to be connected to other people to continue to to grow and live. So I think recognizing that a majority of times we don people-pleasing as a way to protect ourselves. For Mm -hmm. many people, it starts in childhood. Maybe you had uh, uh, an abusive caregiver or an alcoholic parent or something like that, where you realized that being quiet, sliding under the radar, walking on those eggshells kept you safe. Mm -hmm. Well, that starts to embed into the subconscious mind that this behavior, people-pleasing, now has a positive association in your brain. So then when you go into academia and you're dealing with uh, colleagues or you're dealing with other students or you're dealing with the workplace or you're dealing with dating, you have a positive association with pleasing those other people because that's what has registered as safe to you your Mm -hmm. entire life. So I think that piece we need to understand. We don't just develop these habits for the hell of it. We do it because there's a message internally for us that this is how you stay safe. Mm. I was just listening to, it was like a, maybe a minute and a half of this um, guy named John Deloney. And he was talking to a gal on his show and they took a soundbite of it. And it was talking about, you know, she'd been rejected by her father. Mm-hmm. We, She and I had a very similar story. So I was interested in what he had to say. And at the very end of the soundbite, this is what I want to get to. He talked about that's your nervous system. That's your body. Like it sets my husband and I I talked to him about this um, is his family, his mom, I care give she passed, but it triggered. It was the longest trigger (laughs) that (laughs) I had experienced with another person. And I realized that our nervous systems have set points, right? Yes. And those those fears, those anxieties, those whatever, that it's like our body starts at that level. And and for someone whose set point is very high towards stress, anxiety, fear, they're they're already on the threshold before anything's really happened. Does that make yes. sense? So yes. people pleasers are literally standing on the doorstep because their set point is right there. They don't even understand themselves. Wouldn't you agree? There's this, it's so automatic. You don't even know. Your body tells you, oh no, you're not safe. And you're yes. and then you automatically do the behavior. And that's where we see hyper like over functioning or hyper vigilance. Mm-hmm. And it is, and this is also why we're seeing extreme levels of autoimmune issues and burnout and overwhelm Mm -hmm. because what you're talking about is residing in a sympathetic nervous system a majority of the time. Mm -hmm. So our sympathetic nervous system is exactly fight, flight, freeze, fawn. It's warding off some sort of impending threat. 
but now it's not like we just go hunt for food and then we get to come back to our safe camp and chill out. Now we've got, oh my gosh, this bill I'm going to be paid. And we're on a 20, 24 hour news cycle about all this, this stuff that's happening in the world that is incredibly scary and egregious. And then, oh my gosh, I forgot to bake cupcakes for my kid's class. And oh my gosh, I have to sign this contract before. And so what all of those are, are little intense pieces of threat that send mm -hmm. in our sympathetic nervous system. So we don't have time to come down off of that and go into parasympathetic, which is commonly called tend and befriend or rest and digest or yes. you know, some other fun. Uh, Basically, it's the, the chill button. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. So also, what you're mm. speaking to is how new trauma will kick up old trauma. Yes. So if you have something new that shows up that is anything like mm -hmm. something you experienced with an ex or with a parent or caregiver, your body goes, we remember this. We mm -hmm. remember this and it was not good. Send in whatever defenses you have. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes it's people pleasing. Sometimes it is fighting. It's being a little bit more vitriolic. Sometimes it's running away. Sometimes it's complete numbing out and freezing or procrastinating. So mm -hmm. I think we have to recognize that beating ourselves up for whatever behavior we've embodied is not really helpful. It's more helpful to, to ask yourself, okay, when I am in this place where I'm so concerned about whatever everybody else is thinking, am I doing that from self-preservation or am I doing that from as a lack of self-worth? So there are times when that is completely permissible. Abusive relationships are a perfect example mm. of that. That's not the time for you to beat yourself up about your communication skills. That's time for you to seek safety. Yes. That nuance is incredibly important. However, I would say that a majority of the time, we are feeling a sense of threat that actually is, is self-inflicted. Mm. So- that is when you are not doing something based off of self-preservation. You're doing it based off of then I must be valuable or then I might be worthy or maybe I'll be enough if this person loves me, if my boss accepts me, if I get this job. Those are the situations where we're equating pleasing other people with our worth, not with our self-preservation. So that's the key distinct question you have to ask yourself as I'm being pulled to people please here. Is that because of self-preservation? Am I actually in danger or is this just new? Because mm -hmm. like you said about your, ex your example of getting triggered, it's, it, it hits you. It's a gut response. It's intuitive. Mm -hmm. And you're like, what am I, what, uh, I, I don't know what to do with myself. So we have to train that to respond yeah. differently. Otherwise it's going to keep going on that cycle. Mm -hmm. But we do have neuroplasticity of the brain. We are able to create new neuro pathways and which essentially means you absolutely can teach an old dog new tricks. It doesn't matter how far down the people pleasing path you've gone, you can absolutely start discerning when it's in service of you and when it's not. Mm -hmm. You know, the brain science, the the neuroplasticity, that's a fascinating thing because what we're talking about is also neuroplasticity that was yes. ingrained in our brain, right? It, it right. it's basically us becoming aware of these patterns. And I, for me, one of the things is, what are you feeling in your body and where? You know, because usually, if I'm if when I was working through my own it, trauma, I had very specific trigger points, and I began to recognize, oh, before my brain, let's say recognize before I became aware that a trigger was happening, my body knew. Yes. And yes. I, and so I began to learn that the feeling within nanoseconds, the emotion was going to just come blowing through. Do you know what I mean? And yes. so I think that when we see people pleasing, it seems so banal, doesn't it? It's, it's it, you know, it's not like the kind of trauma that maybe that I experienced where it's like, I really wasn't safe. Yes. And so anything, anyone that comes near that, I'm like instant no, you know, but yeah. it's to your point, that self-worth piece, that mm -hmm. piece of feeling like I only have value if, 
Mm-hmm. Right. And I think that's a good thing to become aware of because other people are very comfortable with our habits. It serves these people for us to be the one who appeases, yep. pleases, make sure everyone else is okay. And so I would like to tip the conversation a little bit toward as we make these changes, how that impacts our environments and our relationships. Because all of that pleasing that we do, if people pleasing is your thing, yeah, is actually keeping, if air quotes, the water calm. Right, right. When when you stop, then what? Because there there are levels to these changes that aren't just about you. Completely, 100%. So to your point, yes, there are people who really will prefer the doormat version of you. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. And for that reason, sometimes when you really are anchored into your self-worth or you do start exercising your voice, you will learn very quickly who is championing your best life and your growth and who is in it for them. Here's what I will say. When you have conditioned a way of being where you're not vocal and you're not speaking up, you're not advocating for your needs. It's very easy to fall into a victim place. Mm -hmm. And if only my mom wasn't so overbearing and if only my boss wasn't such a jerk and had such a power trip, like we, instead of going, well, what have I given voice to? Mm -hmm. Because most of the time it's easier for us to sit in our victimhood than it is to actually say, you know what? they probably have no idea how much this micromanaging bothers me because I only tell Susan in accounting. I don't tell my boss, <laughs> right? A lot of times we will speak up. We just speak up to the wrong person. So you might have a massive issue with your partner and it's your mom who gets the earful. So based off of what I have said or what I have done, mm. what might that other person interpret from me? So if you are a heavy people pleaser, it's likely that other people think, A, Gina loves doing that. Amy mm -hmm. loves doing that. She wants to take it all on. She's controlling about that. She'd much prefer to be involved. Or another rational thought is, I'm sure if it was an issue, she'd ask for help. Or I'm sure if it was that big of a deal, she would have said no. All people can go on is what you are showing up as. So unless you are literally saying in a palatable way that somebody can hear, I'm not able to do that. I quite literally am underwater and cannot take on one more thing. I'm drowning. Um, you're not communicating in an effective way. If you're yelling and screaming, if you're being passive aggressive, if you're just listing out all the things going on in your life and you're not being really clear about what you are requesting or what you're saying no to, then that person is just going to be interpreting. So my whole point in bringing that up is a lot of the time, the resentment that we're building towards somebody who is quote overbearing or controlling is likely establishing the boundaries we're not willing to establish mm -hmm. or has been willing to be vocal about their needs in ways that we're scared to do. So it's so much easier for us to label, oh, this person's toxic. This is this, this is this, because then that means we don't have to do a damn thing instead of, really looking and going, I could understand why my partner thinks that I love doing all of this stuff around the house because I am so controlling and critical of them when they do anything, right? So that becomes an element of, okay, if I haven't spoken up about this, I at least need to give the people in my life the opportunity to be what I need. Have I given this person the opportunity to be yeah. what I need? Hmm. It's a powerful question and it's kind of scary too, right? Because we have worn that cloak for so long as people pleasers. I don't tend to be a people pleaser on that level. You know, it's really interesting when we think about these ideas about questioning ourselves and taking responsibility for our part, you know, because as a people pleaser, because people aren't using their voice and they're not taking up space, right? They don't take up space in the world. They're constantly yeah. filling their actual necessary space with, in their minds, other people's needs, other people's wants, keeping everybody happy. But because they're not voicing, to your point, they can become the victim. 
-hmm. their mind frame has put them in a powerless place. And what I hear you saying is acknowledging the part that we play That's right. in our own life and outcomes, whether or not we officially chose to be a people pleaser, to your point, it what we, we learned that that was the best way to exist and stay safe and yes. out of conflict. Nevertheless, I know you, you probably agree with this. As we become adults, as we know better, as we learn things, it's good to reflect on, is this still serving me? It may have served me as a six-year-old because I had no power at six. I really didn't. Right. That's right. And maybe not even at 12 or 15, but there is a point where now I get to choose. Do I continue these unhealthy habits? Do I continue these mindsets and behaviors? Yeah. Or am I really genuinely conflicted with what I really want and need and what I'm projecting to your point? Because I think it is true that we condition people. Like we were conditioned at some point and then we picked that sucker up and carried it right on into adulthood and conditioned everyone else to That's see right. us as that person, right? And I like that you talk about accountability, personal accountability for it. It may not, you may not have started it, but you have the opportunity to finish that in a healthy yes. way. And I think there's a bigger conversation to be had here too around um, systems of oppression. So mm -hmm. the way that I view this is, like, of course, as a woman, yeah, we're still working towards equal pay. We still have a, a very patriarchal society where, you know, we write the na man's name first, you know, very heteronormative, right? We've got all these ways to delineate if a woman is married or not, because your currency was in your eligibility to be married. It was not in your creativity, your intellect, mm -hmm. all of that. And we're still fighting against a lot of that. And then if you layer on other marginalized identities, if you're in a disabled body, we, we're not, we're not super kind to people with disabilities in our culture. So we, we already are up against this hierarchy where we go, okay, if I become vocal, now you're, you're just the angry bitchy woman, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, or, oh yes, you can protest about that, but only if it looks a specific way to us, not like that, not like that. So we have to remember too, that there's stuff that's happening culturally or systemically. And I think that those need that needs an element of recognition and movement. But then there's also what happens nuclearly for each person and individual. So for me, as a woman who is very hetero passing, because I'm married to a, a man, my life has a very different set of privileges than, than somebody else who, who may not have those advantages. So for that person to say, you can just think, think your way out of it, or just, you know, it mind over matter that that is negating an entire structure of our culture that's setting them up to fail. So I think we have to target it both systemically and personally. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. things like this, like having access to podcasts, having access to books and reading materials so that people can learn how to be their own biggest advocate. Those are incredibly important. So yes, when I say radical personal uh, responsibility. Of course, at the end of the day, no matter what oppression is going on, all I have is my own gumption and my own internal self-worth. But the way that oppression works is the oppressed parties have to continue to believe that they're not, not as good as the oppressor. For my audience, age is, is, a, is an on-topic conversation of, does your value diminish as you age? And, and we've been told, yes, you, there, there's an erasure of older women, right? In fact, I recently have been reading this book called In Defense of Witches, and it's not about witchcraft or anything at all, but it's about how women have been maligned through, through the centuries if they stepped out of line. And her whole concept is, okay, think about whatever witch you grew up with, right? And my first thought was Wizard of Oz. And she said, okay, whatever witch you saw depicted, let me guess, she was single. She opted not to have children. She had a career other people did not support. And her closest friends were animals. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that checks off <laughs> right? the boxes. And or little, so, or funny little people. <laughs> right. So of course they get depicted as being 
malicious and awful. But if we look back at that, most of the people who we've branded the witch, the old hag, the whatever, is just a woman who was living life on her terms and wasn't falling in line. So I think we have to keep those things around us as well. Like there are going to be constant pulls towards how our culture works. And at the end of the day, what I always come back to is me believing in my worth or me teaching other women and other individuals how to genuinely believe in their worth is the biggest middle finger to oppression. I mean, it's the biggest anthem for equality is for all of us to genuinely believe in our intrinsic value. And mm -hmm. for some people that's supported culturally and for others, it's not, it's a harder fight. But I think I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that there's nuance there and mm -hmm. that it, it does warrant addressing. But I will say from a practical standpoint, if you're wondering like, okay, where do I even start here? The first thing I would do is ask yourself, who and what do I chronically complain about that I have not actually addressed the issue with that person? Because like I said, many of the times if we're mad, our best friend knows about it, but the person we're really upset with never knows. Mm -hmm. So start taking a little bit of an inventory of, do I come home and complain about my boss, let's say, every single day, but I've never asked for a sit-down conversation with her? Mm. Would that person have any idea that I'm this upset, that it, it has this grave of an impact on me? That's likely your ability to then give them the opportunity to be what you need. So that's a real simple exercise that you can just start looking at. Part of it is also your emotions too. Like when am I frustrated? When am I overwhelmed? When am I really stressed out? When am I angry? Usually that for very people pleasing tendency type of folks <laughs> is because we've said yes to everything. We've taken mm -hmm. on the responsibility of everything and that's that can lead to that emotional ramification. So we can check in with just what do I complain about the most? And when am I experiencing a lot of emotional discomfort? And that mm. usually will clue us into a boundary conversation to be had. Yeah. I think it's it's fascinating how our belief systems also can play into, yeah, you know, how we perceive our ability to have that voice. Yes. Like I can, I cannot. Right. If I believe that I don't have enough value to advocate for myself, then it's true mm -hmm. because I will not take the stance because I don't believe that I can. So I feel like there is a shift in how we perceive our potential to have autonomy in our own lives and in our situations. Because we may have learned that we, quote, don't have value. But the reality is, and I think you and I are coming from maybe different foundational places, but I believe that everyone is designed by God with a purpose and a personality and a, and something. There, There's a design there. You are who you are for a purpose. And we're all like puzzle pieces fitting together. But the picture doesn't ever quite come together. Mm -hmm. when we are not functioning in a healthy, proper way. And that's not a critical statement. That is an observation that I used to be mm -hmm. not healthy and not functioning in my best way. And I've seen how healing and, and, and understanding myself and correcting those things yes. has definitely been an, a benefit, not just to me, but to the children that I raise, the marriage that I have. And so I feel like, there, there is, while we are talking about an individual thing, people pleasing, taking that yeah. personal responsibility, and then looking at this huge, greater cultural picture, I think yeah. somewhere in that in between is the vision of, if I were living into that purpose and design better, if I could figure this piece out mm -hmm. and be more healthy and, and speak yeah. my voice to your point in a respectful, appropriate way. Mm -hmm. How much of a ripple effect would that have, not just for me, right? but on the world around me? And so I feel like 
the global gets a little overwhelming and yes. the full responsibility can be, um, to your point, people get a little vitriolic sometimes because they get so, you know, I have to yeah. fight by myself. But I think there is this in between where this design, this purpose, this who you are, this best version of you yeah. done gently and gracefully, but with intention. Yes. There's some freedom and there's some beauty to that. So I feel like yes. we've talked about both ends, but there's this middle bit where those ripples from these decisions, we've had ripples from this decision and there will right. be ripples as we heal. But ultimately right. the healing ripples are going to be more beneficial to the sure. greater perspective of our nuclear world. Would yeah. you agree? <clears throat> yeah, I think I think it gets it gets tricky because with what you were starting off talking about, like the can't versus I can, those are likely beliefs that we've been grandmothered into without consent. Yes. So there are a lot of beliefs. So if we talk about just what a belief is, mm -hmm. it's not necessarily fact. It's not true. necessarily true. Right. right. If I believe that soulmates exist, that is a hundred percent my responsibility to create that truth. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's not, it is not necessarily a fact. Right. And a universal and so, truth, if you will. That's right. And the same is true. So a belief is a feeling of certainty. And the same is true for a belief like, I believe I could never say that, or I could never speak up about that, or I mm. believe that I am not enough or that I am not valuable. None of those things are fact. They're just a feeling of certainty. And that is malleable. That is mobile. We can change that. So I would start asking yourself the beliefs that I have currently, whether they're about spirituality, whether they're about um, gender, whether they are about your own worthiness or your ability to speak up, where did that belief come from? And mm -hmm. do you continue to consent to that belief? So mm -hmm. to your point, I grew up with messaging that I was broken, that I needed saving and that I was not enough. And to me, that's very opposite than what feels right to me, which is that we all have our own internal compass, our own internal God. And if we stopped searching outside of ourselves for that, we would we would find that we have the messages and the answers without a lot of do dogma and doctrine. But I do truly believe that everybody needs to find that for themselves, right? And needs to figure that out what feels right for me and where do I feel led and where do I feel guided? So I think one of my favorite things to talk about with the, I can't versus I can, my husband always says, throw it in the trash can't. Um, <laughs> so this is another little hack that you can try. If you find yourself caught up in a belief of, I could never say that I could never speak up or even I have to, it's terms that come out like an absolute. I could never, I, there's no one else. It's my responsibility. It's where it's real stamped as certain is to just question that a little bit. And with can't, I reserve can't for things that are not humanly possible. I can't grow wings out of my back and start flying around the neighborhood. Like I can't do that. But to say, I can't, I could never tell him that, or I can't even think about being honest about that, that's not about an ability. That's about a willingness. So when you hear yourself say, I can't, check in and say, is it I can't? Is it not humanly possible? Or is it that I won't? And then mm -hmm. be clear about your choice. It's not that you have to make a different choice. It's not that you have to now start speaking up or have a difficult conversation, <laughs> but let's be honest about what you're choosing. So instead mm -hmm. of saying, oh, I could never tell him that, or tell her that, say, I'm choosing not to. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm choosing that fear hurt is, is more intense for me right now than wanting to flex this muscle. And that's okay. Like you don't have to be a hero at personal development. You don't, it's not <laughs> academia. You don't have to get an A. All, everything is about learning and progression. And is there a new little aha moment or inkling here that I can follow? Um, so 
check yourself the next time you say can't mm -hmm. and is it really I won't or I'm not willing? Yeah. Yeah. That change in language is really powerful. So if you had to give people three anchor points in the tips, strategies, ideas that you want them to take away from this conversation, what would those three things be, Amy? Well, first off, to circle back to what we were talking about in the beginning, when you find that you are compelled to smooth something over or people please or or even avoid someone being mad at you. That's another mm -hmm. perfect place that we people please. Oh, I just don't want them to feel something towards me. <laughs> Asking yourself the question, am I in danger or is this just new? Because mm -hmm. when you had that visceral response that you were talking about where you're like, oh my gosh, this is so dangerous. When we go through that, that will happen every time something is new and we've never done it before because the brain goes, mm -hmm. are you sure it's safe to speak up? Are you sure it's safe to say that you like yourself? Are you sure you want to believe you're enough? No, no, no. We don't know that. We know how to be mean to ourselves and be, wait, what? So sometimes it's just that something's new. You're going into an interview. That's brand new. You've never done that before. Ever met with that particular person. That will send in the fear response, mm -hmm. which can be people pleasing, that yeah. fawn response. So asking yourself, am I in danger yeah. or is this just new mm -hmm. is one mm -hmm. great inquiry. Another question that you can kind of ponder is, have I given this person the opportunity to be what I need? And your entry mm -hmm. point with this is usually your complaints. It's usually your upset. It's usually the things that you want to label them a narcissist or they're toxic or they're this and they're that. They might be. I don't know. But very seldomly do I see situations where it's 100% one person's fault. So asking yourself, have I given this other person the opportunity to be what I need? Have I been really clear, explicit, specific so that they know like, oh, yes or no, I, Amy would not want that. <laughs> and then if you're curious about like, I don't even know where I might need to start Start with a just an inventory about what you complain about. That's mm -hmm. one of the easiest entry points. Just am I constantly getting in a conversation with my best friend about stuff that my mom does and that I've just never brought up? Like just start heightening the awareness. I always say awareness is the win because we cannot make any type of change, habitual or behavioral or otherwise, without having some sort of an awareness. So we need to know where those pockets of opportunity are. And then for a little bonus, I would just circle back to the can't versus can and, and check in with yourself the next time you say, I can't. Is that really true? Is it not humanly possible? Or are you not willing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Amy. How do people find you and what you yeah. do? So my corner of the internet is over at amygreensmith.com. All of those all of those names are spelled the very basic way. <laughs> Nothing exciting. No tricks. And, no tricks. And like any self-respecting Gen Xer, I hang out the most on Instagram. <laughs> Uh, and you can find me pretty much on Insta or any other social platform under the handle, Hey, Amy Greensmith. And over on my website, I've got free workbooks and I've been doing a podcast for, oh my gosh, it's a 10 and a half years. So I've got a back catalog of like 500 episodes, um, some free hip hypnosis tracks for you. So yeah, come hang out, get to know me. And, um, yeah, I'd be really incredibly honored. Awesome. Amy, I want to thank you so much for being on my show today and for um, sharing your wisdom and your insight into this area of people pleasing, which I think is pretty prevalent. And so sure. that we could probably all take some time and take the advice that you share today and improve our ability to communicate clearly what our needs are and have healthier relationships with ourselves and others. So thank you so much for bringing that to the table today. Oh, absolutely. And I, I always appreciate having conversations with folks who have different come froms and different belief systems and stuff. And I think there's a, a nice big lie out there that we can't communicate mm -hmm. kindly and respectfully with one another. So thank you for just modeling that so beautifully. Oh, my pleasure. You know, it's uh, this human experience that we're having 
is complicated enough. Right. right. <laughs> you know, and just finding those points of grace with other people is uh it's a real blessing. So thank you for being there with me today. Oh, I've had a blast, Gina. Thank you. Awesome. Friends, today we've been talking about people pleasing. And if you want to um, share this, re-listen to it, you know, send it off to a friend, subscribe, head on over to www.feminineroadmap.com forward slash episode 350. If you are on YouTube, just look down below. The links will be right there, or you can go to my website and get them. This conversation, friends, it is a conversation. It's an ongoing dialogue around how we operate in the world, not in a critical way, but back to the idea of grace and gentleness, understanding who we are, our worth and our value, as well as to Amy's point, we have different points of view. We have different faith beliefs, but we can approach each other and have a conversation. So even in the people-pleasing thing, trusting that another person can have grace and gentleness as well, and you can have a point of conversation on any topic that can be healthy and forward moving. So I think sometimes we don't even realize maybe these small areas where we silence ourselves, or maybe we even expect silence from other people because we are uncomfortable. This conversation, we barely scratch the service, mm -hmm. but please take the time to tap into the resources that you need. Use these strategies that Amy shared, those last three points, and see if there's not some way that you can become a healthier, better, more communicative, gracious version of yourself, not for other people, but for yourself. Isn't mm -hmm. that something to think about? You can mm -hmm. do better for yourself. You don't have to do it for other people, although it will make a difference in your world as you grow and improve. Thank you for joining us today. And I'm really grateful for the time that you sat and spent with us. I ask that you would just remember to share this information because it's powerful. I look forward to sharing more interesting and impactful people, strategies, and conversations with you in the weeks to come. Take care, my friends. Bye-bye. <laughs>